Thanks so much for joining us for CBN News Today. I'm Ephraim Graham. President Obama announced an expensive new agenda in his State of the Union address last night. It includes billions in new taxes. But as Jennifer Wishon reports, Republicans now control Congress and they've got other plans. Now in the fourth and final quarter of his presidency, <laughs> the president laid out an ambitious agenda, defiant in the face of the new Republican majority on Capitol Hill. Most of it focuses on what he calls middle-class economics. It means helping folks afford childcare, college, healthcare, a home, retirement. He wants to guarantee paid sick and maternity leave, raise wages, and reduce the cost of college. They're ideas that add up to $320 billion in new taxes and fees on the wealthiest Americans. For far too long, lobbyists have rigged the tax code with loopholes that let some corporations pay nothing while others pay full freight. They've riddled it with giveaways that the super rich don't need while denying a break to middle-class families who do. Soon, the focus will shift to the 2016 presidential race, and some Republicans accuse the president of pushing talking points that excite his Democrat base, as opposed to proposals that actually have a chance of passing through the Republican-controlled Congress. There have been presidents in the past who've been repudiated in a midterm election. And in the past, what presidents have done is they have come to the American people with humility. They've said, I've heard the message. I will listen to the voters and let's change course. Unfortunately, tonight, President Obama doubled down. For the second year in a row, I'm Joni Ernst. The Republican response came from a woman. As part of the new majority, Iowa Republican Senator Joni Ernst was elected on a promise to make big Washington spenders squeal like pigs. We'll propose ideas that aim to cut wasteful spending and balance the budget with meaningful reforms, not higher taxes like the president has proposed. And we'll defend life because protecting our most vulnerable is an important measure of any society. President Obama celebrated America's respect for human dignity and condemned rising anti-Semitism. It's why we continue to reject offensive stereotypes of Muslims, the vast majority of whom share our commitment to peace. Texas Congressman Louie Gohmert is miffed the president didn't mention Christians facing persecution at historic levels. We rush around the world to help Muslims that are being persecuted, and yet we have growing anti-Jewish, anti-Christian sentiment, people being crucified again. Better politics, the president says, is when both sides debate without demonizing. Some lawmakers do see areas for cooperation, like infrastructure, helping veterans, even tax reform. They appear ready to heed the message voters sent in November. Look, I, I heard the message on my side, and I know Republicans heard the same thing. They don't want to hear Democrat and Republican. They want to hear that you're going to sit down, work together, at least try to arrive at common ground, and once you land there, get something done. The president now hits the road to sell his taxes and plans to the American people. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Capitol Hill. And today, President Obama makes a trip to Boise, Idaho. Tuesday, he announced he will meet with the family of Pastor Saeed Abedini. Pastor Saeed Abedini is a U.S. citizen who's been wrongfully imprisoned by Iran. His wife, Nagme, wrote an open letter to the president asking for a face-to-face -face meeting. Yesterday, I spoke with Jordan Seculo of the American Center for Law and Justice about Pastor Saeed's condition. You know, this has been a tough time. Uh, there, was, there was a period of time, and uh, we're grateful that this is coming to a close, where it was tough for anyone to get approved to visit Saeed. And so those weekly visits, which have been, so, and they're only a few minutes, but have been so crucial in letting the world know, even our officials in the United States, the U.S. government know how Saeed is doing. There are some spans of time where those have not been weekly and that we've had to go for a few weeks at a time. Those are supposed to resume tomorrow. So even these small victories, uh, making sure those meetings continue so that we know how Saeed is doing, it's very important. He's not gotten the full medical care that he needs. That's still a, a, a real issue that, that hangs out there. At the same time, we'd much rather have Saeed home to deal with those medical issues than prolong his, his uh, imprisonment in Iran. 
Pastor Saeed has been held in a harsh Iranian prison since September of 2012. He was given an eight-year sentence in 2013 for what was termed undermining state security, accused of building a church network in private homes. While President Obama has been concentrating on the State of the Union, the Family Research Council has been concentrating on the State of the Union's families. And as Paul Strand reports, this group has found many are threatened. In his first State of the Family speech, FRC President Tony Perkins wanted to sound a clear warning. Perkins wasn't just talking about the state of America's families, but the challenge these days to their religious liberty. When you look at religious liberty, that is our first freedom, and that is under tremendous assault today. The Family Research Council had some living, breathing examples on hand, like Oregon bakers and Christians Aaron and Melissa Klein, facing a payment of $150,000 in damages for refusing to bake a lesbian couple's wedding cake. A sum that will bankrupt them and their five small children. I had somebody email recently, taking joy in the fact that we might be financially financially bankrupt. And, and I'm going, you know, we supposedly were spewing hate, but true hate is taking joy in somebody else's suffering. In the state of Oregon's view, the Kleins needed to, quote, be rehabilitated from their religious views on the nature of marriage. Needless to say, government re-education regimes are not the American way. I just see it getting worse and worse the more that it keeps, you know, coming up. It's just, it's scary and I just, I feel like us as Christians that, you know, we, it, it's time for us to stand up. Another family facing hatred for their biblical beliefs, the Millers of Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania. The family bridal boutique wouldn't make wedding dresses for a lesbian couple. Much hate's been aimed at the family since. They attacked uh, us and our, our, our Christianity and they actually even made threats against our children and, and so forth. So it's been pretty uh, intense. There was a town council meeting that was uh, held uh, in December to possibly pass an ordinance that would force us to serve uh, same-sex couples. So ultimately it would either force us to serve them or go out of business. The Bracys felt every pro-life family signing up for Obamacare in Connecticut was being forced to act against their beliefs since every health plan offered forced them to pay for abortions. You as a private citizen are being compelled to reach into your pocket and pay directly for those abortions. Tonight in the United States of America, the consensus about religious liberty that we have long enjoyed is being chipped away at with each rap of the gavel of an activist judge or a human rights tribunal. Perkins' bottom line, if you want a strong America, you need to stop ripping down intact religious families. Paul Strand, CBN News, Washington. A 23-year-old Israeli Arab went on a stabbing spree Wednesday morning in central Tel Aviv. At least 13 people were hurt. Four are in serious condition. The terrorist attack unfolded aboard a bus where he reportedly stabbed the driver first to prevent him from opening the doors to allow the passengers to escape. The bus company praised the driver's resourcefulness, bravery, and heroism, saying he tried to protect passengers even after sustaining a deep stab wound to his chest. An elite police unit apprehended the terrorist. The terrorist fled the area. Special patrol units chased the suspect. He was shot in his leg and is now in police custody. We've heightened security in and around the Tel Aviv area and we're still searching to make sure that there are no further terrorists in and around the area. Hamas officials called it a brave and heroic act against Zionists in Tel Aviv and a response to Israel's crimes. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu blamed PA Chairman Abu Mazen for these attacks and called them a direct result of poisonous incitement being dis disseminated by the Palestinian Authority against the Jews and their state. Four men linked to one of the gunmen responsible for the recent Paris terrorist attacks have been charged in the case. They're suspected of providing logistical support to Amade Kolobali, that is the gunman who killed four hostages and a policeman and a police officer in a Jewish supermarket. French authorities are working with other countries to search for other possible accomplices. Meanwhile, five Chechens were arrested in southern France, including one with explosives. And in Greece, an Algerian man is facing possible extradition for suspected terrorist links in Belgium. 
The Islamic militant group Boko Haram is boasting that it slaughtered 2,000 civilians in northern Nigeria. The leader of the group just made the announcement in a video. The attack came a few weeks ago in the town of Baga. And now comes yet another disturbing report that Boko Haram has also kidnapped 500 women and children in that same attack. The London Daily Mail says the jihadists released some of the older women but kept all the younger ones. Boko Haram gained international attention when it kidnapped 276 schoolgirls from a boarding school in Chibuk in April last year. Meanwhile, Boko Haram's violence is spilling over into neighboring countries. About 140 schools in Cameroon have now closed and 10,000 people there have fled away from the border. Is a key U.S. ally in the Middle East on the verge of collapse? On Tuesday, Muslim militants seized control of Yemen's capital city. Yemen is a strategic partner in America's war against al-Qaeda. But political chaos there has terror experts worried about the country's future. Our George Thomas has more. Political chaos and violence are again gripping the poorest country in the Middle East. Two strikes hit the roof of the house and there was dust and smoke. A Shia rebel group called the Houthis are reportedly in control of Yemen's capital city, Sana'a. This was the scene after intense street battles between Yemen's military and Houthi fighters. Nine people are dead and dozens injured. This attack on a civilian area, this is an awful development. Houthi fighters seized the presidential palace late Tuesday. The whereabouts of Yemen's president, a crucial ally in America's fight against al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, is unknown. The leader of the Houthis took to the airwaves this morning as fears of a coup gripped the country. At this historic and exceptional point in time, when conspiracies have been plotted against the country, there is a great danger facing the country. Yemen is a key recruiting and training ground for Islamic radicals. For several years, the United States has poured millions of dollars into the country, largely to fight terrorists. Experts worry al-Qaeda will exploit the current political chaos to expand its power base. The UN Security Council condemned the violence, calling on all sides to stop fighting. The members of the Security Council expressed their grave concern about the worsening political and security crisis in Yemen. The White House, which has touted Yemen's success in combating terrorism, also condemned the violence. But in a sign of just how bad the situation is in Yemen, the U.S. has moved two Navy warships into the Red Sea, ready to evacuate Americans if needed. George Thomas, CBN News. This chip might be tiny, but what it holds is sharper than any two-edged sword. Up next, we'll show you what's behind the Nano Bible. And also, we want to remind you about a CBN News special working on for you this Sunday evening on the ABC Family Channel. It starts at 1045 Eastern and highlights some of our biggest stories and gives you the opportunity to chat live with our reporters about those stories. Be sure to join us. Well, you may have heard about the Lord's, Lord's Prayer engraved on the head of a pin. Now an Israeli company says it's created the smallest New Testament in the world. CBN correspondent Julie Stahl has that story. It's called the Nano Bible. All 27 books of the New Testament were printed in a less than five millimeter square chip. David Almog is one of the creators who came up with the idea. We thought about this idea of and a vision to create something incorporating the nanotechnology that already exists in Israel and basically spreading the, the vision that we have for what it means to have the Bible close to you. CBN News suited up to enter the sterile environment in the northern Israel laboratory where the chips are produced. Russell Elwanger is CEO of Tower Jazz, the semiconductor foundry making the chip. Within the manufacturing processes at Tower Jazz, we have anywhere from 500 to 900 processing steps. What is processed is what's called a silicon substrate, which is any one of these 25 slices in this box. Every one of these boxes goes through its own specific processing flow. Using cutting edge technology, they print the mini Bibles in the original Greek text. Greek scholar Jack Pastor read from the chip with the help of a computer. 
This is the part where he go, uh, Ma Ma Matthew is going through the uh, genealogy of uh, both the Jews and of Christ. Uh, there's no question that this is the text of the New Testament. And we have about over 1,000 books on this 8-inch silicon wafer. The tiny chips are currently made in dependence, and in the future they'll be crafted into other jewelry. We think that something like that has such, can have such a positive impact on people's lives, wherever they live. I think it's a very, very nice activity, I think, for people that are believers in the New Testament. It gives a, a very nice reminder that can be worn as cufflinks, can be worn as a pendant around one's neck. Jerusalem Nano Bible submitted the miniature scriptures to the Guinness Book of World Records. They believe they'll soon hold the record for the tiniest New Testament in the world. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Migdal HaEmek, Israel. Hoping to start your own business but can't find the cash, you might be in the market for a microloan. See how micro lending is now trending in California, Silicon Valley and beyond when we come back. Many Americans dream of running their own small business, but the chances for success are slim. As Mark Martin shows us, a microloan could turn their dreams into reality. When you think of microloans, images of workers in developing countries might come to mind, not people living in tech-savvy regions like California's Silicon Valley and beyond. However, microlending, which has helped the world's poverty-stricken for decades, is booming in these areas. It began on the principle that a little bit of financial advice and small sums of money at the right time can make a permanent and lasting change in someone's life. More than 3.4 million small businesses call California home. They employ half of the state's private sector workers. But get this, 45% of small businesses fail because they're not able to get the loan they need. A microloan can change that. Caitlin McShane works for California's Opportunity Fund, a leader in the national microfinance movement. Leader might be an understatement. Around 400 institutions handle microloans in the U.S. On average, they give out about 45 of them each year. In 2012 alone, Opportunity Fund provided a record 1,200 microloans. Amounts range from $2,500 to $100,000. What we do is invest in the dreams of entrepreneurs and students so that they can build a business or go to college. To us, those are two proven pathways to economic mobility, to the chance of a better life. Since its inception 20 years ago, Opportunity Fund has helped 8,000 people turn their dreams into reality. Maurice Brewster is just one example. During the dot-com explosion, he left a 20-year career in sales management to start his own business. He and his wife Rhonda now run Mosaic Global Transportation, an international corporate transportation company. So we prayed about it and, and um, ended up um, three months later deciding that we were going to take the risk and go into entrepreneurship. And uh, uh, we haven't looked back. A few years ago, business slowed down and the company needed money to keep going and pay down some debt. Traditional banks were no help. They didn't feel that we were bankable. They felt that um, because our assets base is vehicles, uh, very expensive vehicles, by the way, uh, but they were rolling depreciable assets. Other businesses might be refused a traditional loan because they are too young or too small. Maurice heard about Opportunity Fund and found an opposite response. They uh, peeled the onion back. Uh, they got information about our company and about uh, my wife and I. One thing led to another, and by the grace of God, uh, they, they approved our first loan. <laughs> We've got a couple of loans with them now. Maurice's company had around 20 employees when they first reached out to Opportunity Fund. Today, he says they're hiring around 60. So that's uh, you know close to 300% growth, and it couldn't have happened if we didn't have the you know the the, the support of of micro lending. The day CBN News visited Opportunity Fund, we learned this man needed four thousand dollars to take his catering business to the next level. Right now, we're uh, growing so rapidly, we're saying yes to about five people a day, 
and it feels really good. Um, but the relationship extends far beyond the capital to what we're able to help them, you know, come up with in terms of plans and what they're doing for their businesses. Opportunity Fund's goal is to increase financial access and provide microloans that also build a positive credit history. The organization is a nonprofit because it thrives on donations from companies like Citibank. As Opportunity Fund grew, so did the partnership. You know, as you look at it in 2014, we now have product and program involvement with Opportunity Fund, but we also have board participation and we have city volunteers. They come out and support the organization and support the entrepreneurs through the programs. As entrepreneurs grow from an idea to a full-fledged multi-million dollar enterprise, they're going to need different amounts of money. And sometimes there is such a thing as too much. And a microloan fills the gap for anything below what a larger traditional bank loan would be as well as comes with a yes and when you might often hear a no. Leaders here say it's a chance everyone deserves. A hand up, not a handout. Mark Martin, CBN News, San Francisco. More than 30 governors are taking oaths of office this month. Texas Governor Greg Abbott was sworn in Tuesday, but instead of using a family Bible for his first oath, he preserved one of the state's oldest inaugural traditions, using a Bible that's been handed down from governor to governor for nearly a century. As part of the tradition, each outgoing governor marks a Bible passage for the successor. For Abbott, Governor Rick Perry chose a passage from the book of Matthew. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. A faded inscription on the leather-bound Bible reads, Presented to my successors in office. It was first given to by Governor Pat Neff to Governor James Ferguson back in 1925. Well, this time of year, CBN 700 Club holds a telethon to support the work of all the ministries here at the Christian Broadcasting Network. CBN News is a, is a significant part of that ministry, and we are thankful to be a trusted news source for you. We're airing a special news program on Sunday on the ABC Family Channel, highlighting some of our most popular and significant stories. We ask you to join us and do something we've never done before, chat with us live. So be sure to join us at 1045 Eastern Time. We'll be bringing you more on this all week long. Well, that's going to do it now for CBN News Today. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. Want to know what you think about the stories you've seen here today? You can do it on Facebook or at CBN News on Twitter. Make it a wonderful Wednesday, everybody.